All right, good evening, everybody. This is the Monday, April 26, 2021, uh, regular school board workshop for the month of April. It is 6.01, and I'll call this workshop to order. Uh, we will go ahead with the uh, roll call, starting with uh, Mr. Bryant. Here. Mr. Derricks. Here. Ms. Ostendorf. Here. Ms. Tower. Here. Ms. Tift. Here. Ms. Buck. Here. What am I missing? Chair is here. So, did I miss anyone? No. So, uh, all seven board members are here, along with Superintendent Anderson. Uh, we'll go ahead and rise together and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Jennifer has agreed to read our mission statement this evening. The mission of the Reverend Public Schools is to educate and inspire all students as they realize their full potential and become respectful, responsible, and productive citizens. Thank you. The agenda for tonight is just as uh, presented. It is our uh, school board. <laughs> Sorry, my glasses are fogging up on me. Our workshop tonight is on equity. We're talking about our five-year equity plan and um, some participation this evening and some discussion. Uh, we cannot change the agenda because this is a workshop, and so um, it will remain as is. So I will turn it over to Superintendent Anderson. I believe we also have uh, Jess Whitcomb with us this evening. He'll be um, giving us a presentation as well. Well, I'll just uh, briefly introduce uh, the topic. Uh, as uh, Pam said, the topic tonight is, is focused on our equity work. Uh, we did have a workshop last September, I believe, um, with uh, similar topics at hand. And I'm hoping that we can have um, similar discussions multiple times every year. If it's four times or six times per year, I think it's that important uh, to really focus our work. So. Uh, tonight, Jess is going to kind of lead us through uh, some of the discussion topics, but we're really looking forward to, to hearing what what um, all of us are, are thinking and feeling. So, Jess, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Carson, and thank you all for allowing me to uh, be a part of your workshop. It was It's a humbling and nerve-wracking um, experience, I think. Uh, to to lead this so and I know a lot of you have experience um, in leading conversations like this as well so all help um, is will, will be taken um, in the way that it's given so when we think about um, starting I just want to frame our work tonight uh, so I'm going to present the presentation here but a lot of the work is definitely going to be conversation with you all um, and less of me talking. So I'm just here to give some background on what we have been doing, um, but I'm also, hopefully we're going to get to a spot where you all are discussing what we're doing so that we can move forward with your voices. At the so obviously you can see here, this is in progress right now, uh, but what I love about the process that we've gone through is that we've adapted what we are doing based on the different groups that we've got in front of and the different voices that we've heard. So this is an ongoing process. This is not set in stone now that we've put this here, the draft as we listen to more and more voices. So the detail that you guys have, I'm not gonna go through everything in that detail, but you guys have the full plan in front of you um, and if you have those detailed questions, I think that those might be better um, brought up in like a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a meeting with Karsten and I, so we can like explain the detail. Uh, but as we keep going today, I think if we kind of stay, if we stay um, at a higher level tonight, um, might 
uh, make sure that we have some next steps to go forward at the board level. Um, but you you all will leave space for questions, but um, hopefully we can get to that board level. So, you know, we've been talking about having an equity statement um, or policy. And one of the things that I did want to point out to you all, um, because a lot of you had, or some of you had input on this vision and mission work that you had already done. And um, what that says is, bolded part, embraces diversity by respectfully engaging all students, families, and staff. Um, one of the things that we could talk about is, do you find ways to live that mission and that vision, um, or do you add something on top? So that's just a discussion point tonight wanted to point that out. Um, obviously, we're, we're thinking about always, how do we live our values? So when you're thinking about the discussion tonight, we already have these core values as Red Wing Public. But how are we living these with a lens of equity? How are we making sure that um, the respect, responsibility, pride, safety, and community are, we're living these with an equity um, this really is our work under direction three, not another, it's not another thing. It's not an add on. It's creating a responsive, safe and open, respectful environment. That's what, that's what this work is, is creating that responsible and respectful environment. So the objectives for tonight, uh, I'm under the impression that the objectives for tonight would be to develop an awareness of the Red Wing public schools, five-year equity, what the detail is, what you have in front of you, um, that you all get to participate in some of the activities, and then that we create the next steps um, in your own personal racial equity, and then also create next steps for the school board. So as I listen to the discussion tonight, I'm going to consistently be writing down action items that I hear people say. For instance, I just heard Parston say that he would like to add equity workshops three to five times a year. So I'll write those down and I'll put them back up to you at the end um, so you can kind of see the things that you've thrown out over the course of just, okay? Um, to, to start our presentation and to, and to start um, kind of centering us for this discussion, I'd like to um, try something to utilize the chat function. So what you have in front of you is um, what I would like this to be. So what are five words that would represent your own personal equity journey so far? Five words that would describe your equity journey. And I'm asking if you would think for 30 seconds and then put those into the chat. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Pam. Thank 
Thank you, Jim. Anna. Well, I'll give about 30 more seconds. Thank you, Karsten. Make sure I let people get their thoughts in. As we wait, I'm gonna read off some of what we've had. Uh, as I read these, what I would like is for you all to think about three themes that you see based on this, and I'll call this the space that we're having this conversation. Um, and so this is what's in the space now. So dysfunctional, traumatizing, hopeless, fighting, fight, always fighting, alone, learning, listening, intense, vulnerable, hopeful, frustration, aha, guilt, celebration, educating, listening, understanding, acting, humbling, challenging, important, enlightening, frustrating. So as you think about the these words that are in the space, what are three themes that you see? What are three things that you hear coming out of this group? You could put those three words into And then we also have questions, willingness, hopefulness, commitment, journey, continuous learning, understanding white privilege and DNA impacts, minded learning, frustration. Okay, so Jennifer, these are the three frustration, hope, listening. Thank you. Hope, willingness, learning. Challenges growth. Listening, learning, frustration. So as we keep going, uh, if you were to put all these into one jar and label it with one word, what would that be? And thank you, Holly. Difficult, hope, uh, understanding, learning, acting. Jim, listening, hoping, frustration. So if you were to put all those words that we just had into one jar and put a label on it, what do we have in this space? Complex. Hope. Fusion, challenge, always, All right, well, thank you very much for participating in that. Uh, the purpose of doing that is for all of you to see where the people in this space are at right now. So that the what people bring to this conversation is different. What everybody brings to this conversation is different. And what we kind of get is a sense of the mood that we have walking into this and also to know to be sensitive to where people are at and to know what they're bringing. Okay, so that's why we do centering activities into this conversation. You guys um, are a little bit different in this conversation as um, you're being recorded. Uh, so usually um, conversations such as this are not recorded. And so you get to ask questions that you might feel uncomfortable asking in public. Um, you get to be brave, you get to um, ask, ask people to give you grace. 
Um, so I just want to put that out there that that we all are aware that this is a different situation to try to walk through this journey. Um, so if anybody's uncomfortable with ever answering questions or, or commenting, um, I, we understand that this is a different setup. So never feel pressured to uh, have this conversation. So with the norms of going forward with this conversation, um, these are beyond diversity training norms. These are not from me. This is from a training that I participated in. Um, I think Holly has participated in a training such as this. Has anybody else participated in beyond diversity training? Okay. So, um, and Holly, help me out if uh, if I if there's anything you want to add about these norms. Um, Thank so, you. So, speak your truth is really making sure that you're keeping it immediate and personal as you're talking about your experience with race and your experience with your racial equity journey, that you're not saying they do or you do, you're talking about I and me and your own personal experience. And so that's call, that's just making sure that you're keeping it immediate and personal. Um, staying engaged just um, basically means that when people say things that are uncomfortable, that you lean into it um, and that you don't shut down. It might be uncomfortable, um, but it's something that we're all saying that we want to walk in this together and in order to move forward that this is something we're willing to do. Um, experience discomfort. Allow yourself to ask questions and understand what a person is saying um, when they make a comment that you might feel, might feel uncomfortable about. Lean into that. Ask a question. Ask to clarify. Um, otherwise, we never are going to um, so in expecting and accepting non-closure, this is a never ending journey of self, a never and always improving of a school district. Um, we are going forward on this journey together, um, but expecting that we are not going to solve that tonight, but we are making steps forward together and how to how to improve. Question on questions on any of those, Holly, did I botch any of those? All right. Okay. So please, please, please remember these challenges. First, you are being recorded and we know that that is a challenge. Um, second, this may be uncomfortable. This work is really hard um, and we're all going to make mistakes. Um, please, please assume in positive intent about everybody in the space. Um, they have shown up tonight. They didn't have to. Um, everybody's in the space. We knew what we were going to talk about and everybody showed up. So that is the first step. Um, and then this is a never ending journey and a long one. Um, so thank you for being bold and brave enough to, to show up. To so we started um, this journey a while ago with um, defining these different, defining these words. And there are many different definitions of what equality and equity and justice, um, there are many out there right now, but for these purposes, um, how tonight, how I would like to def define equality and fear is that everyone benefits from the same supports. So I, would I would say you give everyone the same thing is equality. Equity is everyone gets the supports that they need. And I know that there are debates among lots of people about what those things are, but I would like us just for tonight's purposes to assume that's what we're talking about when we talk about equity versus equality. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? So one of the things um that i want to make sure that we are all on the same page about is that the school boards um work so far uh is they did some work uh in september uh during a workshop one of the things that they did was they talked about um a red wing public school district working definition of equity what you see on the top is what they decided what they all agreed on they agreed that we believe it's okay to different. Uh, we believe different students need different solutions, treatment to learn and have the same opportunities. Uh, we believe in treating others the way that we want to be treated. 
uh, and we believe in working with many people to do this work. One thing um, that I had someone in an equity training that I attended actually a couple of months ago, they offered this to the golden rule um, is what we call it, right? The we believe in treating others the way we wanna be treated. They offered this amendment, they offered the platinum rule. And so the platinum rule is that we believe in treating others the way they wanna be treated. It's a really simple switch, um, but it actually thinks about how others take our intent um, and so we talk about like how would they want to be instead of saying I will treat them the way I want to be. And so that's something to consider um, going forward. I'm not making that amendment for you, but I wanted to put that into the space. Um, the reason there's a crying child in the, in the picture is because I also had someone bring um, up how to think about this equity work. And I wanted to put this in space as well. So someone said to me, well, how I have been describing equity is that on the playground, all the kids are playing on the playground. And there is one child crying on the slide, this child. We would not stop all the kids from playing in order to see what this one child needs and meet their needs. We would let the other kids continue to play we would go to that one child and ask them what they needed and meet their needs. And that is how someone described equity to me. I thought it was a brilliant way to describe how we do equity. Um, and so I wanted to put that into the space as well. When we ended the work in September, uh, the board decided we needed more discussion on the comment on the structure. Um, we believe in structural and systemic racism slash discrimination, and that it exists in different degrees, um, and then defining systemic racism. So they wanted more conversation as about more discussion on that. So I want to put that into the space for tonight, because I think those things should come out of our discussion tonight as well. Okay. Questions on any of that and where, or does anyone who was on the board at that point want to add to any of the work that was done in September? I think that captures it, Jess. Thank you. Okay. So now this part, um, I want to talk about the why. Why are we focused on equity work? And um, one of the reasons that we talk about is obviously what's going on in our world um, and the need that we have. Also, the data that we have for our school district and the data that we have around our, our MCA scores. We also have um, disproportionality uh, results that are coming from, uh, are coming from GCD. We are three times more likely uh, to, have, to have American Indian students in uh, other health, uh, Sherry, help me, other health, I don't know that category, other health disabilities. Other health disabilities, thank you. Um, disabilities. Thank you. Uh, okay. So we have disproportionality results in our data. Uh, we also have a gap in our learning. It is the reason, it is our why. Our data is our why. That's where we start. Um, and you all you know that you all have access to our data um, but if that's something that you all would like to dig into, we can always get you more data to put in front of you. Okay. Um, so when we think about the disproportionality, we usually start to think of, well, it's something to do with, uh, maybe it's something to do with our special education issue. Well, really, when you look, the reason I put this circle in front of you is how does disproportionality affected by all of the things that we do within our school district and really within our community? So that's what this circle is in front of you for, to consider this. I'm going to leave this up as we go to our next why. So our big picture why is our data and how our structures support 
uh, what we are, the data that we are getting out. Uh, the second thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to listen to, it's not a story from our school district, but it is a story uh, about the on the ground teacher and student experience. Before I go further, does anybody have any questions? Because we are going to listen to something in a minute. Put May I say down. something, Jess? Yes. In those words, you know, especially amongst American Indian with health disparities or other health needs, those are just words that are actually feelings and experiences that I'm reliving right now. And then do you know when this gets out to the rest of the to the rest of the community, guess who takes those flaming arrows when this gets non native people upset? Me. So I just wanted to share that experience with all of you as we go through this, because those are just words to you, as it is feelings to me. Thank you, Nikki. Right, I have something for us to listen to. I want to think about, let's live in Nikki's words and also in these words when we think about what we're, what we're going to talk about next and internalizing how we're coming at this work and how it affects all of us. Right. <clears throat> Everybody give me a thumbs up if you can hear the can you hear it? I grew up in Oregon. My my house, my school, my church were all nestled and nurtured in the black community of Northeast Portland. And it felt like everybody knew each other. We were always seeing each other, whether it was at church or school or at a community gathering. One of my favorite gatherings was the annual celebration for Martin Luther King's birthday that would happen at Jefferson High School. The whole neighborhood would flood the auditorium at Jeff and there would be an all day festival to celebrate his life. Now, to understand the significance of this festival, you need to know that in my neighborhood, we loved Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> he was taught to us the most in school as an activist and a leader of the civil rights movement. At church, his face were on some of the fans that we would fan ourselves <laughs> with. Some of our grandparents had his picture framed and hanging in their living room as if he was a family member. And in school, we would argue about who would get to read the paragraph that would tell about his life in our history books. So he was special to us. And this celebration was epic. African dancers, poetry performances, theater performances. There would be people reciting his speeches and always a call to action. Somebody would always say, we have to keep living the dream. Use your voice for something good. Stand up against injustice. and." As a kid, I didn't think that they were really talking to me. That stuff was for the adults. But in the fifth grade, my teacher taught us that we didn't have to wait till we were adults to use our voice for something good. There had been a tragedy in our community. She came to class with tears in her eyes. It was the middle of November, right before Thanksgiving. And she told the class that an Ethiopian man had been killed he had been killed by skinheads. His name was Mulugeta Sarah. She told us that they beat him with a baseball bat so bad that the bat split in half. 
When she says this, Jennifer, the only white girl in the classroom says, wow, he must have had a hard head. And she laughs. None of us black kids thinks this is funny and neither does our teacher. She takes her into the hallway. I don't know what she says, but when Jennifer comes back in, she sits down and takes out her notebook. Our teacher has asked us to write a letter or a poem or make art. And we're gonna give this as a gift to the family. So we stuff our handwritten condolences in this wicker basket that's full of fruit and food. And I don't know why I was one of the students selected to go with our teacher to take this gift. And I was proud and I felt special, like my, my voice was doing something, my poem was gonna mean something and we brought this gift and the person at the door thanked us, but it was very clear that they really had nothing to be thankful for. So much pain and sorrow in their eyes, and I was frustrated and disappointed because what was the point of doing this if we weren't going to make it better? And, and I asked my teacher, like, why did you make us do this? Nothing has changed. And she was like, well, it's not about that. It was never about changing anything or making them feel better. It was about letting them know that their son and their father would never be forgotten. It was about standing up to a hate crime, to an injustice, and, and adding our voice to the chorus that this is not right. It was about doing what artists and poets do, she said. Artists and poets respond. <laughs> And so I thought about this in the weeks to come. There was Thanksgiving and then we went on our winter break to celebrate the holidays. And I kept thinking about what she said about art responding to injustice and our voices mattering, being important. When we come back to school, my teacher's not there. She's taken a leave of absence because her husband is ill. And so now we have a new teacher. And this teacher is opposite of her in every way. This teacher is a man, he's white, and he never has us write poems. I don't think he likes us either, and it's very clear that we don't like him. One day, he draws the mouth of a whale on the chalkboard, and he's explaining to us that whales eat small aquatic life forms. Then he turns to the class and says, so you see, this is why that story about Jonah and the well, it's just a fairy tale. All those stories in the Bible, none of them are real. He says this, even though he knows that most of us are Christians, that on the playground we sing gospel songs and reenact the service from the past Sunday, making fun of the women and their big hats and the way they shout and say, amen. <laughs> he says this, and when he says this, what I really hear is that he's saying my mama is wrong and my granddaddy and all the people who raised me, who does he think he is to tell me God is not real? Our class bands together. We refuse to answer any of his questions. And there are a few boys who have mastered the art of the spitball. Every time he turns his back, somebody spews a spitball across the room and it hits him in his head or his neck or his arm. He doesn't know who's doing it, so he's just yelling at all of us. And then Jennifer says, it's them. They're the ones doing it. And so the boys get in trouble, and now the class really cannot stand Jennifer. There is talk about there being a fight after school to teach her a lesson and tell her to mind her business, but then we find out that the boys are getting suspended for a day, which means they won't have to come to school, which means they really don't have it that bad. So <laughs> nobody fights Jennifer. But a few days later, she does the unthinkable. We're learning about Martin Luther King Jr. and she blurts out in class, I don't understand what the big deal is. Why do we have to celebrate his birthday? I wait to see what my teacher's gonna say. Wait to see if he's going to take her out into the hallway and do whatever it is that teachers do when they take students out into the hallway. But he doesn't say anything. He doesn't do anything. 
And by the end of the day, rumors are spreading through the fifth grade like fifth grade cooties. Everybody is saying that Jennifer hates black people, that she says she wishes slavery never ended. The rumors are brutal. And there is definitely going to be a fight after school. Never mind that Martin Luther King stood for nonviolence. Never mind that just a few days ago we were good Christian kids defending our faith. People are talking about going over to Alberta Park and teaching her a lesson. So when the bell rings and I see these students running after her into the park, instead of trying to stop them or telling the teacher, I turn the other way. I go home mostly because my mother does not play. And she knows that what time I get out of school and wants me home at a certain time. So I just obey my mother, go home. And the next day when the principal calls me out of class to ask if I know anything, probably because she trusts me and thinks I'm a leader and that I'm gonna tell her what's happening. I don't say anything. She asks me, well, do you know why someone would even want to fight her? I mean, she's hurt and she's afraid to come back to school. There has to be a reason what's going on. I don't say anything. I mean, of course I know the answer. The answer is because she's the teacher's pet and, and because she believed also that, that Jonah couldn't have been swallowed by the well. The answer is that she talked about Martin Luther King like he was a nobody. She makes us feel like we're nobodies, that's the answer. Those are the reasons. The reason maybe wasn't about Jennifer. Maybe it was about our teacher who also made us feel like nobodies. And we couldn't hit and punch and kick him. Maybe, maybe it was also because an Ethiopian man was hit and punched and beaten with a baseball bat. And we were sad. We missed our teacher. We were confused. And sometimes sadness feels like anger and you just get so tired of hurting and you want to make somebody else hurt too. There were many reasons. But I, I didn't say anything. Jennifer never came back to class. And I don't know that we missed her or that anybody really cared, but I have thought about her over the years. And I've also thought about my silence. I've thought about how if I really believe that a poem could be impactful and, and be meaningful, even if it didn't change anything, then I also have to believe that my silence was harmful. And that's the thing I learned in the fifth grade that the voice, it is powerful. It is a mysterious thing. Because even when it's silent, it can still be heard. Thank you. So I'm going to let that sit for a second and then the questions that we're going to talk, think about uh, would be what confirmed what you already hold to be true was new learning or surprised you and how does this change what you do going, I'll put those back, I just want you to sit with it. Jess, could I say something? Um, you know, Nikki's statement was pretty powerful there. We don't know what she has has faced, what she's going to face. But uh, as a group here, we need to, whatever comes out of here, understand that we support people like Nikki and others. Um, we're grinning, we're trying to understand it, but on the end of the day, she she and others need to know that we will support them 
and uh, and I just I can speak of experiences myself, but that's immaterial. But there's clearly a a disconnect there that we need to as a group when this comes forward, as Nikki talks about to the press, to the public, need to be 100% behind her and others that feel this way. Um, I can't, I have a young man that part of my life who's a young black man who's like a son to me, or yeah, a son to me. He and my son were very close. He never had a, a father. I mean, he did everything with us when he was growing up. Um, I witnessed some things, I stood up, but I don't know what they're like because I'm not in his shoes or in Nikki's shoes or others. So, but uh, with that said, know that we all need to change. We all need to look at things and um, I'm willing to be there for somebody like Nikki and others to go forward to try to uh, um, make them so they don't get to feel like they do and I'm glad for she spoke up tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Well, I think that leads us really well into this um, iceberg here. Um, because of what Nikki shared, um, she shared a lot of the feelings um, that she has. Um, so based on your own personal experience, keeping it immediate and local. Um, Jim did that really nicely. Nikki did that really nicely. Um, what's under the water in this conversation at Red Wing Public Schools? So we have the outcomes and our data, but what is driving those things? What are the structures and the beliefs we have in Red Wing Public Schools? Because we're keeping it here. Um, we know that community affects that as well, but these this is what we get to change the Red Wing Public Schools, so we're keeping it, keeping it there. Does anyone have anything um, that they would like to share about this? Because as we answer these questions, we'll talk about what we just listened to, we'll talk about anything that's in this space, um, and anything that's in this ice. That's what I will open it up to for, for now. And I do appreciate you all being uh, really brave in this conversation. Thank you. That's hard. Um, Jess, I put my name in the... Oh, I'm uh, sorry. No, that's okay. I didn't know if you saw it or if Pam was running it or how it was being run. Um, I agree with Jim a thousand percent that this board, it's our responsibility to stand behind the community and our community in Red Wing is very diverse. It's getting more diverse every day. And as leaders, as adults, as you know, teachers and care providers, we set the stage for how we want people to treat each other. And what is under the water for me right now is the aggressive and passive aggressive and violent words that people are using in classrooms on Snapchat, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, they're violent. Whether or not you're punching somebody, you are assaulting them by using a word that could harm them or making a face or a reference or dismissing somebody's feelings. And so to me, that's what's under the water in Red Wing Public Schools right now. And it's not like it's never been under the water. It's always been under the water. And some of us learned differently as we grew up in Red Wing, how to navigate that, but not necessarily how to embrace to be helpful. We either ignored it or we got into little side conversations or we would call somebody, but collectively it's our job to lead this. And so I really wanna thank Jim for starting it out and Nikki, Thank you. Thank you for running for the board. Holly. Well, one of the things that Jim and I and Holly and I kind of went back and forth a little bit over email over the, the last, the end of last week is, 
you know, when we think about what's under the water and some of our structures, um, you're exactly right, Holly, and Jim said it well too, that where we have, um, we set the tone and we set the tone by our policies and we set our tone by expectations, not just expectations of how behavior um, and words matter in our buildings, but how we can um, put forth structures for students and teachers so that we can make Red Wing a better place when our students are not within our walls. And you you're, you hit the nail right on the head, Holly, in, in saying that you know we, we can't have some tolerance some days and we have to have a very strict and cons, um, concise and um, appropriate um, consequences because bigotry and words don't have harmful, aggressive words don't have a place here. And how do how do we live out that mission? Like you said earlier, Jess, how do we live that out? Part of it's our policies, part of it's our expectations, part of it's curriculum. But I think another piece of it is these kind of conversations. And for the community to hear that we are seven strong member board who all agrees that that kind of stuff doesn't have a place in Reagan public schools. And how do we live that out? That's I think the next step. But I think we need to, um, Holly asked for a hard stance and I, and I think we have it, but people need to hear it. People need to continue hearing it. Um, and people need to hear that we've got some policies and procedures in place in our district to be able to address that aggressiveness and um, harmful and horrible, um, not always intentional, I don't think, some, for sure, but I, you know, I think part of it is is the learning and understanding and, and creating a space where we can have these conversations. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Pam. Uh, if we could shift back a little bit to the content that we had and think about um, kind of what what we heard while listening, and then also um, thinking about again if anyone had anything to to share about what's underwater in this conversation. One of the, this is Anna, one of the things that um, I thought about and that I think is relevant to Red Wing is the idea of who belongs and um, I guess who gets to have a voice and um, that's something that I think comes up a lot in Red Wing. I've lived in Red Wing for almost 18 years. One of my kids was born here, the other moved here when she was 11 months old. Um, but I'm still not born and raised in Red Wing. And so I'm still an outsider in a lot of ways. Um, and I think, you know, I, because I'm white, I can blend into some circles, um, whereas, um, other student, you know, other people who come into our community stand out more and I think can get extra excluded. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the discussion that we're having tonight and issues of racial equality are things that matter to everybody. It's not like this is a new Thing. It's newer that it's, you know, such a, a topic of conversation, but, you know, I think there's some idea that, oh, this has never been a problem in Red Wing, or why is this a problem now? Um, and I think it's just that we haven't listened to people who have said it was a problem. And um, I think that that's one place where our... Um, I'm curious about the, um, the data that we have, uh, really looking at why there are the differences um, in opportunities and achievements and how students and teachers feel, especially when they maybe don't get to, or don't feel comfortable sharing how they feel in a, a larger group setting. 
sorry, I was just writing down. I, I heard a couple of action items there. Okay, anybody else before we move to the next? One of the things that kind of struck me interesting and, and perhaps there's more to the story than what we were hearing, but when um, the speaker talked about how her classmate uh, Jennifer had asked, well, what's, why do we celebrate his birthday? Right? So that's a really great question. And I think the next thing we know, people want to beat her up after school. Well, she asked a question. And if we want to learn and grow, we have to be able to ask those questions and not necessarily um, automatically assume that she was asking in a disrespectful manner. Maybe she truly wanted to know the answer to that. Help me understand why this gentleman, why are we celebrating him? Help me understand. Because somewhere along the way, she didn't get that message um, in school, from her family, from her friends. And so if she's willing to ask a question and put herself out there to be a little bit vulnerable. We can't have a text coming right back at you if she truly really wanted the question answered. And so what Jennifer has learned in that story is I better not ask any questions anymore because people are going to beat me up. And so she's stopped coming to school. She went somewhere else. Who knows what her story was after that? But if someone's willing to be able to, to put their neck out there and to be able to ask a question, we have to be, you know, I heard listening and, and questioning and learning when we talked about our, our words in the beginning here. But if that were me, I would stop asking questions because I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get beat up. I don't want to be followed home. Um, and words matter, right? We've, we've talked about that already. So I guess that's what really struck me is, you know, she went out of her way to ask a question and she was met with resistance because people assumed, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, we don't know all the story, but what we heard tonight was that she was met with aggression back. Thank you, Pam. I think uh, one thing too to remember is how much power both teachers had in the situation. Both the power of words from a teacher and action. Okay. This is where historical trauma comes in though, you know. And I'm going to mean this in the nicest way possible because I am here. I'm doing the work. Like I said, I'm the one with open wounds here, you know, coming in to make a system right for everybody because this just does not affect ethnic people. It's anybody who's different. And this is what we need to get across and communicate to. But Pam, when you say that skin color doesn't matter, and I'm just going to say this again because I want to explain to you why it does matter. When you say it doesn't matter, that allows people to erase who we are and not allow our cultures and traditions to come into this district. When it doesn't matter, it allows when the English learners came to you guys and asked for help and this um, special education. But yet we're having special meetings about hockey. That's where the inequity is. So skin color does matter because it allows us to help people that need the help. Thank you, Nikki. Right. I just wanna, I, I need to respond to that, Nikki, because when I said skin color doesn't matter, I was referring to when we make policies we don't make separate policies based on somebody's skin color. So when I when we were talking about changing a policy, which was a shortened quarantine, that's a policy. Skin color should not be a factor when we make a policy decision. So when I said skin color doesn't matter, that's where I was coming from. It has nothing to do with how we treat each other, but that's 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 the context of where those words came from. And I'm sorry if that offended you that in no way um, was at all what I meant by those words. I know, but this is where the problem comes. What was one of the words? Listening, learning. Those aren't being done because when I tell you, you automatically have to come back with an excuse. 
And when I did tell you at that meeting, you came back with an excuse. So this is why it gets extremely exhausting for people of color to speak because nobody listens to us. It takes white people to tell our story in order for people to understand. And that is the point I'm pointing out tonight. Even though I know of purest intentions by all of you, I just want to make it very clear through a Dakota eyes where we come from. Well, I think uh, one of the things that uh, through reading uh, the White Fragility book, um, one of the things that I think she does a good job of um, thinking about in the, in the book is about um, how we all take in feedback in this conversation. And one of, one of the ways, um, one of the things that she said is um, if uh, white people uh, took feedback on how our intentions are met um, with two people of color, that if we took the feedback and sat with it, um, what would that do? And, and somebody said, if that happened, it would be revolutionary. And so to, to think about um, how we all take feedback in this conversation, and this is hard, and I don't want to, to discount where anybody is at. One of the things um, somebody said is we're all coming to this discussion in a different place, but hopefully we're leaving also in a different place. And so we're having these hard conversations and engaging in this. And I appreciate everybody putting their truth into the room because that's the only way that we can keep going forward. So I hope we're all in that space. Okay. I think it would be good to keep going because I see is here, one of our students. Um, and we have Mick here. So I'm going to go past this here. Okay. Um, and I'm going to start with, with you guys. So um, Dee, I'm not sure if you or Mr. Wenland is going first. Um, it's Mr. Wenland, I, I believe. Yeah, I thanks everyone and thanks for letting us um, come in tonight. Um, this is was on with us when we did this before with our you know, the League of Women Voters in town. And um, that last part there too about starting in a different place and leaving in a different place. I feel like every time I enter into one of these conversations that, that continues to resonate, I always pick up something new and, and continue. And how much of this is, is, it is a journey. It's not a check a box done. We've, we've had our three meetings for the year and we're, we're golden. Um, so just sharing a little bit about some of the equitable practices um, that we've been intentional on this year. And one of the ones that uh, I've been working on has been with our career speaker session. On Wednesday this week, we will have uh, over 80 speakers that will have presented to our high school students in grades 8 through 12 this year. And one of our uh, one of the pursuits has been to pursue people um, who are professionals in across career areas that represent our student body population. That as students are considering potential career choices, that they see um, examples of themselves in different areas, so that none of our students are consciously or subconsciously ruling themselves only belonging in one area or, or that they don't belong in a different area. Now, this is a pursuit, I, you know, in 80 speakers, I do not have a full representation of our student body in every career field area. Um, but that'll be a, a, a career <laughs> career pursuit to continue to provide. Um, same with our, uh, our STEM special that we've had at the elementary level. It's been an intentional pursuit to make sure that our students are represented in the different speakers that we've had. Um, Jules Porter was our presenter in, in February. Um, she's incredible. Uh, she is a Marine veteran. She uh, has her law degree. She is launching a video game onto Xbox and uh, PlayStation at the same time. And she just finished her seminary degree. <laughs> so a little bit of everything. Um, so she was an amazing speaker to have. And then we piloted something new in that last session where we invited uh, any student who wanted to come to a, a second session where she could kind of talk about her experience um, black woman um, going through each of these different facets and things that she learned and just provided an open conversation for students to ask questions. Um, we're doing that again this session. Um, Sonia Smith, who was with us uh, previously before she took her job at MDE, is going to hold that session as well. Um, 
And then we are also holding a session that is um, only in Spanish. We met with our ELL teacher and they asked their students and they uh, requested a, a speaker to come in um, and talk about being an interpreter and translator. So we have um, a gal from Geneva, Switzerland, who speaks four languages and we'll do uh, one session in English and then one session also in Spanish. Thanks, Mick. Go ahead, Dee. Thank you for coming. Of course. My name is Yari Cooper. I'm the president of the Redmond High School Black Student Union. I'm a freshman in, in the high school. Um, over the summer, I talked with Mr. Remnitch, and, and we agreed that with the circumstances that happened, that some change needed to be done. So I offered the opportunity for a Black Student Union, and we were just recently approved. Um, the whole the whole point of our Black Student Union is to is to create a safe space for Black students and students who want to learn about Black history um, and make it a safe environment, but without coddling and bring. We just want to be straightforward and we want to um, use our voices to speak up. We are currently um, we're currently playing a fundraiser with Applebee's, a dime to donate um, this late, the coming May. And um, we plan to do some more fundraisers. We are going to try and go up to the cities, look at the George Floyd Memorial. And we are also trying to um, donate money to Dante Wright's family. Um, we recently, our group was one of the groups who spoke with Jules Porter which is really like beneficial to a lot of us because I know some of us um, had some, got some really good ideas from her about like how to plan for our futures. We recently attended a Black Youth Summit seminar. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it was earlier this month or last month um, with With Tom, with Thomas from um, the University of Wisconsin, I believe. Um, that was really beneficial. We had um, almost a full turnout. Um, there's about five or six members, because um, as a new club, we, we ha were recruiting. And we have officers, and we are. I was really excited to see what will come. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. And thank you, Dee. And I think uh, also, I think uh, you have requested if we, she could come at a different time to kind of talk about their progress, maybe a, another um, workshop or a, just sort of general school board meeting. So thank you for coming. I know I get nervous during these, so we appreciate you coming. Of That's why I didn't look at you all the way through your speech. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so I just want to leave any space if you all have questions for, for Mick uh, or for Dee. And then also to think about now that you know that some of this and we've highlighted some of this work, obviously this is not all of what we've done in year two, um, but are there things that uh, you either learned or how you would react differently or you would act differently based on information that you now have. I just want to open up. Um, I just have a quick question. Mick, what's your role with the Black Student Union? I don't have a, a formal role with the Black Student Union. Um, uh, Mr. Chose is their advisor. Uh, so with this speaker, uh, last session and then with this session, um, wanted to reach out and encourage those students for sure that make sure that they were aware that this was a possibility um, but i don't have a form okay thank you i was just curious if maybe you were the advisor all right um d that was awesome thank you so brave thank you All right, I'll give a little more space, but otherwise we can move on to the next one.
Uh, so this is directly from um, a training, and I'm going to ask that Mick stays on for this, um, just as a, a different perspective. Uh, he and I um, went is are going through the Institute for Courageous Conversations along with um, eight other of our administrators, uh, and that's being um, done through uh, the Institute for Courageous School Leaders at school district and district leadership um, from Melissa Krull and Candace Raskin um, from Minnesota State University Mankato. Uh, and so that's the one of the institutes that we're going through. We've done about seven sessions. We have one more coming up. This is directly from the work of us reading uh, White Fragility uh, and then being in conversations about it. So what we are going to do is just let you all know um, kind of some of the work that we've done and Mick and I, our reaction to some of this uh, conversation, just to give you a lens on some of the work we've done. Um, so one of the things uh, that we had as a discussion point was the idea of this like good, bad binary in when we talk about racism. And when we talk about racism um, and people have defined a racist as bad and not racist as good, which puts up walls for us when someone um, suggests to us that we have done something um, that, is, that is a racist act. And when we talked about, um, when we talked about this, what hit, um, what hit me was how um, this, has, this was like a brilliant way to keep racism alive is to make it seem like you're only a bad person if you are um, expressing something that is racist. Well, in fact, you can be racist in a moment um, and not be a bad person, but taking in that um, feedback and making sure that you are moving forward and thinking about how you don't do that next time, it's also a continuum. Um, and so one of the things that we talked about are this the difference between, um, there's like two um, kind of ways that we show up in this either talk about being colorblind, um, and this is some of, these are directly from um, white fragility. This is just a picture of some of the statements that people say uh, when we are, when we say that we are using the colorblind argument and why we are not racist. Um, so this argument of, um, I'm not gonna read them to you, but I just want you to look at, look at these colorblind statements um, one of the things I wanted to share was my first thought in reading this and during the training, um, I went right back to um, when I was teaching in Milwaukee and all of the kids in the class um, were, all of the kids in the, in the class were, back. and but one of the, this one kid came up and, and I, he was saying something to me about him being black and I said, um, I, I said to him, well, I don't care that you're black. He looked straight at me and he said, well, I care. And I, it was a moment of that, um, and I, I've shared this in a lot of different spaces because it, it shook me out of um, moving forward. Oh, okay, so it's the platinum, right? I need to treat people the way they want to be treated um, and look at them at, at how they want to be looked at. And so I just wanted to share how that hit me during that training and then Mick, Sorry, right, go ahead, Holly. I can wait until Mick's done. I just had a thought about it. So either way, I'm good. Okay, maybe we can just let Mick go and then we will all circle back. Is that all right? Okay. All right, go ahead, Mick. So the other, uh, so this came right afterwards. So colorblind was kind of the first excusal that some people will have to kind of dismiss themselves from conversations of race. And the second one is color celebrate. And so these are the things that uh, people people sometimes will take pride on or, or have the historical uh, box. And, you know, I read this and I was like, this is this is where I camp out, right? I, I taught for seven years in Anchorage School District. It has the most diverse schools in the nation. I have a nonprofit where I work in Cambodia in the summertime and we go there every year. And so, um, you know, for me, this, this really resonated as just because I've had those experiences, just because of the things that I'm doing in the school district or have done, it doesn't mean I ever get to check the box. You know, it doesn't mean that I can't ignore the conversations and just remain vigilant that I'm not that teacher 
from that thing that we listened to earlier, that I miss a moment where I, I could have stepped in, where I chose inaction instead of action. You know, if there's a conversation that happens in the hallway at any moment, I could choose to move somewhere on that spectrum um, because it's not about being a good person or a bad person. It's about what are you choosing to do and what are you missing to do? So even though I have some of these things that are in this area, it doesn't mean I'm ever excused from the conversation and there's work to continue to be done. Thanks, Nick. Um, so Holly, uh, go ahead and, and start us off here. Yeah, I was just gonna say um, in some of the work that has been new to me in the last year was everything is measured against being white. So white is the common denominator, the baseline. And so it, it appears, and it often is the case that white people lend privilege to people of color because the baseline is white. So everything else is compared to white, which is not how it should be, but that is how it has, that is how it's always been. That the white is the baseline and everybody else measures against if you're white, well then the white people say this or the white people say that. So we should all be thinking in that lens, which is what Nikki is saying is like from her perspective, she doesn't measure the world that way. And so, how do we then measure the world through her eyes? How do we measure the world through somebody different than us instead of assuming that white people have the say in how all things should go and everything should be measured against whiteness? Does that make sense? It's complicated, but it's actually very real. I am not the expert. None of us are, but we happen to be the majority right now. So then everything is measured against what we do. But I have no clue what many my peers and many of you know everybody in the world thinks about something. It's not my opinion that makes it okay. Thank you, Holly. I'll leave space um, for others here. So um, for the last couple of years, I've kind of been going through some of the um, anti-racism education for myself um, and that good bad binary was kind of a hard thing for me um, so like it's easier for me I think now to say I am racist that I don't intend to be I don't ever want to hurt anybody, but I have been raised in a culture that is racist. And I have been raised and I have internalized racist beliefs, even, and I'm trying to challenge them, right? But they're there, even if I may not always know that they're there. And so to kind of come at it from that lens, instead of a, no, I'm not racist. If I can just already get over that hurdle, that then it's easier to kind of listen and say, okay, now what do I do? Um, how can I change this? How can I listen better or um, respond to this in a different way instead of having to be defensive and to say like, explain why I'm not racist. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't know if that's coming out clear or not. <laughs> I don't mean to say that like, you know, we should celebrate that we're racist or anything like that, but just that already starting from that point of acknowledging that, yeah, I have internalized things that I need to work through um, makes it easier to then process because I'm not stuck on trying to explain why I'm not racist. And also um, there is some forum I was involved in where it was, um, one of the the kind of tenets or rules was that you don't get to the person the the person who has done the offending doesn't get to a doesn't get to claim that they didn't offend someone right that the person who has the feelings gets to own those feelings like whether or not i intended to hurt somebody's feelings doesn't really matter um i can only just acknowledge that how somebody feels and then move from that, I can't, I can't argue somebody else's feelings. 
I can't argue that they shouldn't feel the way that they feel. If they feel the way they feel, that's just a given, and then we have to move on. Thank you, Anna. Jennifer, you're in the queue. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree with what Anna said. Um, that's something that I've been working on, too, is just accepting the fact that I am white and privileged and part of a culture um, that is racist. And so I need to recognize that I have learned things that are racist, and I need to work through that and be responsible for that and make changes. Um, and also, I think as a school board, we need to recognize that the systems in our country and in our city are uh, racist. And so we need to work within that, recognizing that the systems were built for white, basically middle class people, um, including our school system for children. And so we need to constantly be aware of that um, so that we can make the changes so that they no longer are only um, meeting the needs of those students, but that we are open-minded and understanding that um, we have a diverse community here with needs that are not being met. And not because we don't want to meet those needs individually. We all do. We have all said that tonight, and I believe that. Um, but we need to recognize that we can't just say that. We can't just say, oh, I'm not racist or I want what's best for all the kids. Um, we really need to dig in and look at what is happening in the school district and where can we make those changes um, moving forward so that we don't have students feeling like Nikki has felt growing up in Red Wing, in our community, in the school district. And we do have students like that now. Um, and the goal should be to not ever have that moving forward and so um, I, if I could just go back a minute, just thinking about the first um, woman who was speaking and the whole idea of voice um, and being silent. And I, I, I think as a board, we need to recognize that we can no longer be silent. Um, we need to let the community know that this is how we are feeling. This is what we believe. This is what we want to do. Um, and make it concrete. And I think that equity state statement is an important start for that. Um, but then I also need, I think we really need to um, bring forward voices of our community members and um, listen to people, and Anna said this earlier, that aren't often heard. And that needs to be a priority for us. Thank you. Nikki? Um, I just wanted to share an example. Um, I didn't realize I loved learning so much until I, as an adult, set up my own system. And so um, throughout my life, I've, I've gone, you know, back trying to learn things that I was pushed through with Ritalin that never, because I just, I don't process things the same way as other children. Um, so I wanted to go back and learn about, um, what was it, the, the Holocaust? And, um, and in, when I was learning about it in that moment, I couldn't help but feel just immediately with, you know, the concentration camps and stuff, I felt like guilty because I'm a quarter German, and even though I didn't know if my relatives had anything to do with that, in that moment, I felt guilty. But, it, but given the thing, I put my walls down in learning that because of my experience as American Indian. I, I, um, I gave compassion, I gave empathy to our Jewish relatives, you know. Um, and so I quickly moved through that feeling um because i accepted i just accepted their feelings and their you know um and sometimes i kind of look to that group for healing for our own people you know um and just even learning from my uncle um and he 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 
went the same way too, you know. They do they do it with um, forgiveness and compassion and let's learn from this, you know. So that was my experience. And so <clears throat> you have to maybe at some point understand the dysfunction of our world right now, you know. Um, some Washitu people, this is this is just new. COVID's new, right? COVID's new. This is COVID. This has been our entire life here. Especially us biracial people. When you're not quite on one side, but you're not quite the other side. But fortunately for me, I had such a loving, wonderful tribal community that if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't survive. That is what I want to give to Red Wing. I want to give Red Wing a sense of community so we can raise our kids together. Give them what I have so they can survive. Thank you, Nikki. Anybody else? I want to leave space and then I would like us to move to the action items that I have heard from some of you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Karsten. Yeah, I'm in the queue there. Uh, thank you, Jess. The, um, you know, I've certainly been guilty of complacency or not taking a strong enough stance on, on different issues. So I think that's something that, um, you know, answering the question, how does the change, how does this change what you do going forward? I think it's important to identify the issues and then speak up about them. You know, others are so much better at it than me, uh, but I'm going to make that effort. Thank you. Anybody else? Sometimes all students need are an extra 30 seconds, so I just leave it there. <laughs> right. So you all have the three to five or the uh, five year plan in front of you. If you have more questions about that, um, I would love to, to talk about that more in detail. Um, Jennifer had a couple of questions about clarifying a few things. I think those are amazing discussions to have, but I do want to keep moving forward. Like these are, this is Wing Huey, who he's, he's said that he would participate in our perspectives class again. Um, this is uh, Sam Oaks. He'll be doing our anti-bias anti training. Um, and then we are looking at expanding our Native American curriculum from the Minnesota Historical Society. So those are some of the highlights that we are doing with our five-year plan. But I would like to just keep going with the action items that you all have come up with, if you're all right with that. And then if you have questions about the plan, if you could reach out to me and that detailed, um, we can go through it. That's okay with you. Okay. So this is where we were. Um, I'm going to... So this is where we were um, in the end of September. The highlighted, um, so what everybody did was come up with um, these how many eight uh, suggestions. What happened was then you all asked, well, not all of you, but the school board then asked the administrators, could you give us a suggestion on where the work is for the board? Those are the highlighted ones um, that the administrators said, I feel like this is more the work of, um, of the school board. So what I would add is I did hear from you all, um, and I, I would make put it here, workshops discussing equity. Carson and I would put your three to five equity workshops here adding those, um, drafting an equity statement was one. I heard that again, an equity statement or an equity policy. I think the next steps for that could bring some examples to you all, or that's what we do for next steps is would be kind of up to you guys. Um, 
what what the administrators said about these ones here is like that we're not um these are not suggestions that we aren't doing but it's just the work of the administrator instead of the board um go ahead holly uh so we have policy a thousand which is our equity policy. Mm -hmm. And so where do you see that fitting in to the next steps? It's a, that's a great conversation. Okay, so we have talked about it a little bit this summer and, um, but not enough. I mean, not, not even close to enough. And so we did review it, which is what we do with our policies, but if the um, policy committee has a recommendation on something that they want to do, how does the board give input to wording or whatever? So how do we embed those two so that the stance and the policy and the statement on where we stand together is all embedded? That's all I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah I'd throw that back out to the group. What do, what do you all think? That's what this space is for, right? Say, how do we do that next? One thing that um, I think you and I had talked about at one point, um, and I know Jennifer had talked about, was on our um, like one page, I'm looking at it right now, <laughs> um, statement that our educational plan. Like we have um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in that educational plan, but it's not like part of that one page that is included in every single board packet and you know there's a giant poster of it sitting here in the media center um that i think having a statement that can be incorporated into that or and or beefing up the mission statement to include that so that it is a little bit more front and center would be good i agree if our equity statement could be on that somehow or yeah, as part of the mission or part of the vision um, I know that uh, Jesse pointed out that diversity is on there somewhere in the vision. Uh, in the vision. But it, uh, in my opinion, it needs to be a lot stronger and more clear on what we're trying to do as a district. Hey, Jess. Yep. What? What did the admin team talk about looking at data? Did I miss that? What is what does that statement mean? Um, that one was from you guys um, today. Oh, was so doing oh okay. A, yeah, okay. doing a deep dive. It wasn't, it wasn't on the other, it wasn't on the, the thing, okay. No, this is, so the top three are the ones that you all came up with and then the, the admin team said, yep, we agree that these top three would be a good work for the, for the uh, okay. Board. These bottom ones are the ones that you all, I heard. And so if you guys were like, oh, I didn't mean to say that now would be the time to take those ones off. But I'm just putting on the ones that I heard from you as you guys were talking. So for instance, um, Jim, one, one of the things is get 100% behind um, Nikki and we all need to change. What is that? How? I'm, I'm wondering about that. Is that the equity statement? Is that um what would that be but that sounded like action to me a hundred percent behind her i don't know what that looks like yeah no i i'm just still trying to wrap my head around i'm just trying to understand the data i what what data did we talk about that i i miss it if it was brought up here i think that might be from my statement this is anna okay. um that you know we have data that shows lower achievements Okay. for certain groups of students, right. um, especially students of color. But what is that? Like, um, and a disparity in the achievement, is it that we are not providing the, the correct educational environment? Like what is really happening there? And one of the things that I wanna see is not just like the test scores, but like how are students feeling like what's that environment and this is something that the equity team or equity committee has talked about um and like that's what i kind of want to know is what's what the students feel is going on because we have 
you know, by and large, a white administration and teaching staff and all of that. Um, so we could end school board. So we could apply a lens and explain like, oh, these are the scores that we see and this is why we think it's happening. But I wanna hear from those students what they feel is happening. Why, what's not working for them instead of us trying to guess and, you know, top down it. I wanna somehow figure out what's going on a little bit better. Yeah, that, I, and that, That's fine. I just was wondering, trying to understand where it came from, so. Thank you. I think that would be very powerful to and compare that to the data we have. If there's somehow we could um, find, you know, the reason for why our test scores are the way they are, so that we can make changes. Um, but I think talking to the students, getting information from the students, would be an important piece of that. Well, and and guardians and and you know the the adults the supervisors um for those kids that aren't uh, that don't have parents too i mean i think yeah. that's important for them to give us some feedback too so what i'm hearing is like to get groups or um to get more to get more information to be able to to put that into the equity statement like we're making a commitment to x y and z yeah. because would, this is what we hear and what we've learned from our community I agree. I think parents and guardians should be involved, but I, I think we really can't leave out that student piece no. that sometimes we forget that part and that they can no. speak for themselves, especially at the high school. Um, explain to us more what's happening with the community there, with the climate in the building. And, um, and of course, um, there's lots that doesn't get told to parents. No. <laughs> uh, I think I saw Holly in the chat. Is that wrong, Holly, or is that an old one? That's an oldie. Okay. It's an oldie. I didn't see you. Nikki, go ahead. Um, testing is awful for our children. I opt. Um, well, I didn't even know that MCs, MCAs were happening for my, and I kind of just kind of forgot that that's the area with my son. So I would have definitely opted him out of that. I would have known ahead of time, but he's going through it. I opted my middle child out, um, awful test taker. And today we even talked about this, me and my boss. My boss is um, white and she's awful test taker too. She was given her, her reasons why. Um, very smart lady though, but she just tests, they just scare her. And this is why tests scare me because you are asking me, you're trying to trick me through these questions, just how our people were tricked through these treaties. So now I have this massive fear of punishment if I answer these. And it's not even like that the Institute would have um, and made me feel this way. It's just that historical trauma piece that now I feel like if I answer these questions wrong, that. I'm going to be exiled out of the state of Minnesota, or I'm going to be um, not fed by the United States government. All these historical trauma things come in to play um, when it comes to test taking. And that was through my eyes, my experience. Thank you, Nikki. Holly? Uh, yes, there are many studies, and I'm only referencing them, that show the multiple ways that tests fail to truly measure student knowledge. You know, the IQ tests are under controversy because they're designed for white boys, much like um, standardized testing. So when that gets really looked at and how we value that testing component and what it means for kids, we're stuck with it. And I say that as somebody who always tells my kid, hey, do the best you can on the MCA or, you know, do the best you can on your ACT, knowing full well that that his brain doesn't penetrate that way. Question, answer, question, answer, time frame, stamina. You know, those are those are really kind of adult level skills that a lot of adults haven't even mastered how to sit for long periods of time and question, answer, question, read big passages. So as we move forward and look at data in terms of, you know, who are, who are failing the tests and who are passing the tests. Those are, 
those numbers we can look at right now. Who are passing the tests? And what, why are they passing them? What advantage do they have that allows them to pass the test? And what, it, what disadvantage do people have in, in not passing the test? So I'm glad that you brought that up. And as a school board person, I support the district's stance on MCAs and I support the parents' options to opt out. But the research around why <laughs> we take tests and what the tests measure and how we value education, that is one snapshot, but it is given so much power that it really skews what we do in school. So, you know, thanks, Nikki, because your response is like dead on. Like so many things go through your head when you're asked a question. And it is confusing. It is tricky because four of them are so close to being right. So who says what's right? Mm -hmm. And can I just kind of bounce back with you on this? Um, I just want to, um, I have, I'm just going to, I have three kids, but I'll just give my two girls an example. My eldest, um, above and beyond, always exceeded expectations. A, 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 A. Not just, you just never, and, and honors classes and whatnot. Excellent test taker. Confidence like you wouldn't believe. Um, second one not so much and I think it was in the third grade and I just want to give a shout out to Mr. Lahammer um, for finding this with my Nina and advocating for her right to be able to express her um, take test and express through like um, moving her body and being able to stand and do all these different things um, to accommodate her and her testing that is what we need to be doing as a district and that just hits that equity line. You know, what doesn't work for Nakomi um, works for Nina. What doesn't work for Nina works for Nakomi. We need to be able to comp stagger these expectations for all these different learning styles. And I love the fact that you said you support the MCAs and you support the parents. That is beautiful. I hate tests, but I love people who I love people who love tests. And so I love tests to be around for people who love tests. You know what I mean? This is where we need to start coming to as a whole group is just just um, honoring and respecting that, that diversity in between. So I do, um, thank you, Nikki. Um, Pam, I wanna respect you had said that you wanted, um, I, th I think that we were holding a, an hour and a half I'm over that right now. Um, what would you like to do? Uh, well, you talked about next steps. Um, how are those going to be addressed, those next steps? So I would kick that back to you guys. Um, what, do you, what do you want to do next? Well, I think when we talk about drafting an equi ec um, equity statement, um, we talked about, I, I think that's um, some of the work that the equity team is working on. Is that correct? Uh, we are not drafting an equity statement. What we are doing, um, it was an, a suggestion out of the equity team that they would give that work to the school board. Um, but we could, I could go back to the equity team and ask if they could put some examples together or if they could do a first draft. That would be something I could ask them for. I have not done it so far, but that, that doesn't mean we can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where are we at with the strategic plan in terms of years? When did we complete that? Was it 20? I think we're in three, right? Oh, this is our three. second year of five years. Second year of five. So, so we'll have to start thinking about it. The only reason I'm thinking out loud right now is because this will be have to be a huge part of our next strategic plan. But we, we're a couple of years out still from that. So I, I think it'd be really important for um, perhaps the administrative team can look at, and I think that's where we ended last time in September is, this, is the admin team was gonna go back and look at some things. They were gonna bring their points of view back to us and say, here's what we think or here's what we do. What I heard loud and clear from our meeting tonight is that we really would love to hear from people in our community from our students, from our parents, from our guardians, on um, how things are going, where we're not measuring up. Um, and I think that's important feedback to hear before we have an equity statement. Um, 
attempted maybe? I don't know. Anna, what do you think? <laughs> um, I was just going to add to that. I think we need to hear from our community and, you know, acknowledge that, um, you know, the majority of our board is white and, um, you know, we're all of a certain age, like we're not kids in high school. Um, there's a limit to kind of how much we can understand. We can empathize, but we can't, we're not necessarily in that position. Um, so I definitely want that. But another thing that I was just going to um, bring up is, you know, centering the voices of people of color who are doing this work. Like White Fragility is a great book, um, but the author is a white woman. And so as a white woman, like she has certain perspectives. Um, there's a real, uh, the best, for me, the best book that I have read um, is So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Aluo. And um, there are lots of other great books that, um, you know, I know that the, the previous board before <laughs> this one started um, had done reading like with White Fragility. I don't know how those of you guys who did that felt that that worked, but um, if we add that to a thing that we want to do as the board, I would just really like to encourage us to choose something that's by an author who has a lived experience that is not white. So just so we can clarify, the board hasn't together read anything yet. We, we got them for, for people, um, but we have not had a space for people to react to it or to actually go through a process of dealing with what's in the book. And I don't know that for us to work on this together as a board, I think is difficult because as you mentioned, like being recorded, <laughs> being able to have this played back forever and ever for the rest of my life, um, you know, sets up a little bit of a challenge, but because of open meeting laws, we can't get together and talk about this. So I don't know if it's something that like we all have to do on our own or we do this in separate, you know, smaller groups or whatever. But um, I think it's important stuff for all of us as individual board members to kind of work through but there's of course a limit to how much we can do in a public space. And we have a lot of meetings. We spend a lot of time in meetings. It's, you know, I don't want to throw more meetings at us. Um, and it may not be the best way for, you know, things to happen. I, I think I saw Nikki had put her name in um, and then Jim. Yeah, I was just gonna um, ask this. Um, we're getting, we're looking to get the, com the community, the parents and the children and stu well, students and their families, their, their, um, their input and stuff, but who, how do you plan on reaching out to them? Is, you know, you can't just use me. You know, I've got a lot of parents right now that have a, 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 a very big issue that's going on. And I think they're more concerned about the disciplinary action of the things that are going on in the school right now. So, um, you know, I, I'm willing to help and because this is a thing I'm going to give you um, just by even working with tribal community. We have members that will not engage with people and especially white people for good reason. You know, it's that trauma piece that I, I, I keep bringing back. Um, and plus, you know, this work, it is hard, you know, um, and it's exhausting and you know our washichu relatives they can they can choose to just walk away you know we don't and so um it's hard to trust it's hard to build those trusts when pe people they get exhausted they're you know it's a door and um so what it has been my job is helping our membership connect with our um washichu employees and um, because they are, they do have my coworkers. I can't even, I can't even go into describing like how beautiful they are, and you know, doing this work for me. We're changing a lot of lives in our community, and um, you know, I can't be the one that always is the face. You know, so when I say things like. I put myself out there for the Hispanic community and I invited you guys to do the same too. You know, I can't tell you what to do, but you should really introduce yourselves to other groups of people. That's how you make those connections. 
put those barriers down. I know it's scary and stuff like that and trauma. I know because everybody suffers from it. So I just start putting yourselves out there, you know, and, and see if you get somewhere because we can't always rely on Nikki to be the voice of everybody. Jim. Thank you. Um, I think our next steps would be uh, have, like you said, so the group there to draft some, some uh, do a draft on the equity statement for us to review. So we could go back and forth for quite a while here. Um, you know, we can't, we can't change the past. We can learn from it. We can get better because of it, but we can't change the past. Um, but I'm willing to do what we can to improve the future. And uh, I think if we take, there's eight or nine of these items here, if we take a couple of them each time we meet the next, uh, how many times we're gonna meet, three to five, whatever it is, take a few of those, because we can go on for quite a while here and and, and, and we're just gonna um, get as far as we are right now, probably, um, with our discussion of this. But uh, that'd be my point is do a couple, take a couple of these in the next few meetings, each one, whittle them away, and maybe they'll grow or maybe they'll incorporate each other. But uh, uh, I'm willing to do something, but I think we can, uh, um, I know we're, we can look at it down the road instead of just trying to come up with that statement tonight. So, does anyone want to put their name next to anything that's here? kind of the way that we've been doing the five-year plan is to Jim's point. Um, and it doesn't mean you're the only one doing it, but it means maybe that you're the person that circles back with it in your next workshop. Is there, are there any on here that you want off? I, I, I'll, I'll just add a number two. I mean, I have no problem lobbying the state legislatures and this and that. But where do we start there? I mean, how do, how do we start with that? Um, uh, I think that probably is a, a further discussion or through the legislative team. Um, so, but uh, I think adding that add equity to the one pager is a pretty one that we should address next time or or soon, along with the statement. And. Uh, uh, so, oh. and then that policy, look at policy 1000, it's about the same time. So those oh, are my I, three things. Jim, do you want me to put your name next to those? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you very well here right now. Sorry, do you want me to put your name next to those? I still can't hear you very well. <laughs> but I'm doing it until I'm you just kidding, of course. Um, uh, I don't want the policy one. I've had enough over the years. Add equity. Yeah, that looks. You looks like you already added my name. So I, I that's fine by me. So. <laughs> and uh, did you want it here? And did I hear you say um, that you want number two? That that might not be one that you think goes. Here? Oh, oh no! I wasn't trying to. I think I, we had the admin team, or the ad the group was going to come back with a draft statement, not me, but. Uh, and then number two was, I'm just trying to understand how you lobby the state teacher education programs to include differentiation. Um, I, like I said, I have no problem lobbying the state. Mm -hmm. but are you talking late state legislatures? Are you talking Department of Education? I'm not sure where they're talking about for the lobbying or is it all of the above? Probably all of the above, but um, you all can help me. Um, I, I think in talking to other people that that might already be in there, but this was a suggestion um, from the September workshop from you all. I would, Not I you would, all, but the board. Yeah. I would ask that maybe we put multiple people on each one. Okay. I mean, you know, two of us could, two or three of us could look at going back and forth on some ideas there instead okay. of just one person thinking and others not, you know, others might have some valuable points to add sure. I was just gonna 
ask permission. <laughs> if I can just jump on each one with everybody else instead of just pick one and take one lead because I just am a worker bee and I just don't set the structure very well. I just like to work. So I was wondering if that would be okay if I could just jump on them and be with people with them. I got no problem with Nikki being on all of them. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? I was I, I'm just, just one gonna, person. Yeah, I was just going to say we should all be on the bottom one. That should be an all statement. Yes. Um, I don't know about the get 100% behind. To me, it's not subjective, but to some people, it might be subjective. What my 100% might be somebody else's 10% or somebody else's 1,000%. So I think we need to be a little bit more clear on get 100% behind. Having been through this workshop, we all kind of know what it means. Yeah. But I don't necessarily, we haven't heard from everybody tonight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's fine. People talk and speak when they want. But I think the other thing that I really need from this process is I need time to reflect. Mm -hmm. I need time to reflect on this whole conversation. I'll probably watch it again, which is not something very common but I will probably watch it again to just kind of hear what everybody has to say and, you know, reacquaint myself with some different perspectives that I haven't been familiar with or reflect on what I said and see if I'm walking the talk. So that's kind of where my head's at. I just, I just need some reflection time and I don't know what the time frame looks like on that. Um, or how we measure that. <sighs> so. I agree, Holly. I would, I agree with everything you say. And, you know, I, I get the hundred percent. She said that, you know, you can't force somebody to be passionate about something that they're not the idea. So um, racial equity, you know, the thing is, is um, in our way of life, um, we give you the tools, resources, we give you the consequences and, you know, where you're going to go on these decisions that you make, but we don't make you make those choices. We don't, we, we we're there to help love, support and guide. And then in our way of life, if we do our jobs right, then they come back just like uncle had hoped, you know, I, I came back, I, I, I came back to him and he taught me and that that's our hopes if we, if we do it right. So I, again, like as much as I want everybody to be a hundred percent on board with this, it's, we need to heal, have that healing component. And Jess and I have talked about that numerous times. And, and it's about bringing down that vulnerability and, you know, understanding and compassion. Because I, too, am going to reflect and take it into the next steps with Holly and review this. Because this session for me was completely filtered through trauma. And I, too, want to learn and grow as well. Um, with everyone and so i want to see from other perspectives as well um not just my own so thank you holly for pointing that out one of the things i want to add is um anna and i've been going through phase four training through the minnesota um, school boards association and it's all focused on policy and so that look at policy 1000 is a great is a great starting point but what they're really suggesting um that I heard loud and clear um, from the first part of this training was we need to, when we review every policy that we have, we have to look at every word through an equity lens. So in our next round, and as we're reviewing every single policy, and that's all of us, I mean, it starts in the, in the policy and legislative committee, but as we get um, times then to review our policies, that should be all of us. We should all be looking at every single policy that we review through that equity lens and making sure that it fits for every kid. And that's really the basis of our, our school district. It starts, you know, if you're building the scaffolding, it starts with those policies. And so if we can, if we can really start looking and digging deep into the words in our policies and what's, what's the meaning, but what's the meaning behind that? And how are we going to live out that policy? How are we going to have those procedures in place to support the students um, from, from you know, our, our diverse community? How are we gonna how are we gonna live that out? So 
you know, when we talk about policy a thousand, I think we need to, to think about every single policy with our equity lens and maybe we need to change some things. And so I think as we continue forward um, to have that at the forefront when we review our policies. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I don't want to speak for you, but I heard you're doing this phase four too. Is it all right that you're on that? Me, Anna. Anna is. Yeah. Oh, Anna, sorry. Okay. Anna, what is that okay that I have you on there? And I would like to be involved if there are focus groups with students and family and community members, you can throw me on that. I would love to be involved in that. You can put me on that too, Jennifer. Yep. Nikki Buck too. You really want to be on all of them, Nikki? <laughs> I said I just I just want to I just like okay, I really like togetherness. I really like being part of a group. Um also you you guys keep me um focused on you know the the um end goal, you know, the hyper focus to not, you know, get kind of caught up in all these feelings and stuff like that. So I like togetherness. I just kind of work better with people. I think I saw someone. Thanks, Nikki. I saw somebody in the chat. Learning. Um, sorry, Holly. Can you help me? With yeah, this? you know, when we look at our one pager, and Pam is right, and we've talked about this before um, throughout the last year, but we haven't had any action statements on it or actions. But our one pager should just intentionally start with we will look through and we will use an equity lens in every piece of you know work that we do throughout throughout the district somehow acknowledging that our voice isn't the only voice we are we are a community of people from every race religion color background and we have to come together so that's kind of where i'm at with the equity statement pam like you said it's it's got to just be embedded and so eventually board members will think First thing, how does that impact equity? You know, we should vote on X, but but really, how does that impact equity? I don't know if this is what you wanted, Holly, but I added you to the draft equity statement and the equity one pager. I kind of feel like those are two, those are together. Yes. Okay. Just, just put me in all caps. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and then I think the other piece, um, looking at our data, the deep dive into achievement data, I think part of that needs to come after we do some of those focus groups. And I really will, um, I, I think those need to be well done. So, you know, it may take some time to get those done, but when we bring our, our community together to get some feedback, um, you know, I, I think that we have already talked about looking at data at, in a workshop. Um, and so maybe we can push that off a little bit or maybe do a, a shorter dive first and then a deeper dive later. Um, but that's already on our docket to do a little bit of a, a, a debrief on, not debrief, um, you know what I'm talking about. We, we already have that on our radar to look at data, but we, act, we absolutely have to relook at that data with the equity lens. So how and when and where we do that i mean maybe we maybe uh in our agenda committee tomorrow we can take a deeper dive into putting some structure behind some of that if that's okay yeah so pam do you want to so this doesn't mean you are doing this but like you're following probably following up so how i would envision this list going is that if you add the three to five workshops that you would come back to the next equity workshop and how you would start it is this is where we're at with the things that I signed up for. And so that you guys are always checking back in and you might go, yeah, it was a flop and we need help, right? You might go, we went way further than we thought we were gonna go. Um, but those are the things that you come back to the board with that they like, here's where we're at. And some of those, I, I, I don't know if some like the policies and things like that, that takes board action. So you'd also have to say, where does that go? And, so are you okay with me putting there, Pam, maybe Pam and Jim, since you guys are the agenda committee? Is that true? Well, that's a really good place to put it to begin with, but you know, we'll want board um, feedback on that too. So we can put together some a beginning and then get feedback on that. Correct. 
I don't hear, I hear why this is important. I don't hear people wanting to sign up for lobbying the state right now. I'm wondering if we can take that one off. I don't hear people signing up for that one. Yeah, I think that's a good idea to leave that one because I'm not sure if any of us know exactly what that is. Yeah, I think that's a big bite to take when we have plenty of other things. Okay. Is there anything that I missed that you felt like I came up with an action and just missed it tonight? Um, is there anything on that that isn't on the list? You know, I'll, I'll just add that um, it's not on this particular list, but there are some other activities or plans in our five-year framework. For example, hiring uh, practices, you know, that I think should be a really important strategy to focus on. So, you know, my suggestion would be to take this work that you just created there and then incorporate it with year two, three, and four so that we have the overall plan. Sure. So this would, are the, is the school board going to do something with hiring practices? Because this list to me is only school board action. The other actions are like admin or teachers or, right? So is hiring practices that would be on the board? Yeah, that's been a, a, a potential topic for a board workshop for quite some time. So I do think that we need to address hiring practices in general. You know, perhaps the admin team can reformulate some of our practices and share it out, you know, for feedback. I'm not saying it has to be a whole session necessarily, but. Oh, okay. So do you want it to be a presentation or a board workshop? You know, maybe Pam, Jim, and I can chat about that. Okay. We talked about it originally as a board workshop with presenters and more dialogue. So um, that's kind of my vision based on what I've heard in the past. But yeah, we can discuss that more. And if, if board members have um, want to weigh in on that, if we want it more of a dialogue or just a straight up presentation. Um, and and I think I think it is a board workshop because it's on the list. But I think it's it's an admin administration function too to make sure right. uh, we shouldn't be developing um, procedures. We should be uh, or practices that should be brought to us in reference to a policy or a, 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 through the admin. But we we need to we do need to have a dialogue on the hiring practices. So. And workshop. So Jess, we you send this possible next steps? Will you send this out to each one of us so that we have that? It, or at least to me, so I have, and I think all of us would be great. Mm -hmm. Jess, would you add me to the, um, the data piece? That's something that I'm interested in being a part of. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, that was Jennifer. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> you got, your voices must sound similar in my head, sorry. It's probably hard when you can't see us because our mic is one mic, so we're all in person tonight. All right, well, I didn't do it in an hour and a half, Pam, I apologize. <laughs> Pretty close, we knew we'd go over. Okay, uh, well, thank you all for allowing me uh, to be a part of this uh, and thank you for the work that you're doing uh, and the support that you've given uh, the administrators and the staff in order to be able to do this work with you. Thanks Jess and Mick. Jess especially you took a lot of the did a lot of the leg work and heavy lifting so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right then I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Um, ah, by Holly, roll call votes. I think it was first. <laughs> Arlen? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Holly? Aye. Jim? Aye. Nikki? Aye. Their votes aye. We are adjourned at 8.05. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you.